Okay, good. Yes, uh, let's start. Uh, yeah. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it is my great honor to open this webinar on the global status of commercialized biotech GM crops for 2019. This webinar is hosted by the EFRI Center of ISA, the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications, and supported by Wageningen University and Research, PRRI, the Public Research and Regulation Initiative, ASAIA, the Spanish Association of Young Farmers, and FSN, the Pharma Scientist Network. My name is Justus Wessler. I am the chair of the Agricultural Economics and Rural Policy Group at Wageningen University and Research. Our group carries out research focusing on economic and institutional issues within the bioeconomy and teaches across a wide range of aspects related to the contribution of the bioeconomy and the agricultural sector, in particular to sustainable development. Researchers at Wageningen University and Research have made substantial contributions for advancing crop, animal, and food production and placing this into the context of sustainability. Technical change, such as the developments in biotechnology, play an important role to address the many challenges caused by climate change and to contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals. As economists know, technological change is necessary to address the challenges, but not sufficient. Technical change requires an enabling political and institution. Uh, let me just um, continue where, where I stopped. I think what, what is very mm -hmm. important is mm -hmm. to consider that agriculture contributes to about 30% for greenhouse gas emissions. And we oh, expect okay. that the yield for maize in Africa will decrease by about 20% due to climate change. And that the people being undernourished to increase by a factor more than three due to climate mm -hmm. change. Now, COVID-19 has exposed some of the weaknesses in the agriculture and food system, impacting farmers' incomes increasing the number of people who go to bed hungry and driving up food losses and waste. GMOs have increased crop production in many parts of the global south and contributed to reduce poverty and increasing food supply at local level. Despite some of the successes in the global south, the potential of GMOs have not yet been fully harvested. Applications are often hampered by government policies that increase investment costs or even prevent application. One example that has received wide international attention, for example, is the decision by the Court of Justice of the European Union placing crops developed by using new developed plant breeding developments such as CRISPR-Cas9 under the regulations for GMOs. In this context, the annual report prepared by ISA provides an overview about what has been achieved with respect to the commercialization of biotech crops. The report has become a valuable resource for researchers, policymakers, and stakeholders. We want to discuss the implementation of this report and its relevance today in this webinar. The webinar will be organized as follows. First, Maha Lechumi Ayuyanan, or Maha for short, the global coordinator of ISA will provide an overview about of ISA and its relevance. Then Professor Paul Tang, the chair of the ISA board, will present the highlights of the global status of biotech crops for the year 2019. And this is then followed by a presentation of Bibiana Iraki, the program officer of the ISA Africa Center. After the presentations, we will have a panel discussions on the implications of GM crops for sustainable, de sustainable development and the importance of the European Union and its policies. Paul Tang and Margaret and Bibiana Iraki, they will be joined by Daniel Mogondu, a farmer from Kenya, 
Max Kadung, a PhD researcher from Wageningen University, and if possible, Klaus Amann, who tries to join us as well. He is a professor emeritus and former director of the Botanical Garden by the University of Bern. And then we will have a close up with some finishing and final remarks. Now, to the participants, you all have the possibility to raise questions and provide comments on the presentations and the contributions by the panelists using the chat options of Zoom. Catalina Mesa will monitor the discussion in the chat room and report back on the comments and questions to the panel. Now, uh, Let's um, get started. And the first uh, presenter will be Maha. She is the coordinator of uh, ISA and the executive director of the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center, MABIC. She is the founder and editor in chief of the Petri Dish and co founder of Science Media Center Malaysia. Maha is an adjunct lecturer at Monash University, Malaysia and Ames University and an international consultant for FAO Biosafety Project Sri Lanka. Maha has a PhD in science communication and a master of biotechnology from the University of Malaya and a BSc in microbiology from the University of Putra, Malaya, Malaysia. Maha, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wessler, and thank you so much. I want to, as a global coordinator, I want to, I want to thank our supporters, University of um, Wageningen and PRRI, ASAYA, and also Farmer Scientists Network. I want to say that this is the first time ISA is launching the report in Europe. So I am uh, here to also introduce ISA to the stakeholders in uh, Europe, what we do, and also to briefly uh, talk about the impact of Europe, uh, their position on biotech crops to the developing world. So this is what I'm going to do very quickly. I'm going to take you through my slides. Um, the Biotrust Consortium is uh, what ISA is going to do next. So before that, let me start with um, Professor Wessler mentioned the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. And I will always say all the 17 SDGs, except for a few, all the others, the solution can be provided by biotechnology and some of some audience um, pre previously, when I say this, asked me, how about gender equality? And I would say yes to gender equality as well, because a lot of farmers, women farmers in developing countries, especially in Africa, they do not have equal access to technology. And if we give them the access to good seed variety, to technology, then we will see that the production from women farmers will be on par with male uh, farmers. And this is where we will see food security. So I would strongly say biotechnology offers us a lot of solutions. It's not a, a magic bullet, but it is one of the tools that should be in our toolkit. Now let's briefly look at what's happening in uh, in the in Europe. Now, even before we started this webinar, I already saw a question in the chat box that asked, why does Europe ban GM crops? Now, you see, this question is always there. So when we talk about the potential of GM crops, biotech crops, and what they can do to alleviate um, uh, uh, poverty, hunger, farm, uh, farmer uh, access to farmers uh, to encourage sustainable development or sustainable farming, people always ask, A, hey, but Europe is not approving it. Europe is not growing it. So this type of things, we live in a networked world where all these things travel to many other parts of the world and this influences decision making process in developing countries so here is how i would say the information center the epicenter if that is in europe then it travels everywhere else especially to africa and we are going to talk about that to other developing countries and the uh, decision makers in all these countries make decisions based on what is happening in europe so we urge europe to go by science. And one example is the Seralini study, which until now, although it has been retracted many times, until now, it is being used to make decisions. So I'm also going to talk um, about the, uh, the other Europe uh, EU factor, where the number of biosafety approvals remains 
low and it is declining. Less than 100 events have, have been approved in Europe and many decisions are based on ideologies and we have got issues with low level presence LLP due to asynchronous approvals where it is not approved in Europe, but it's approved everywhere else. But the fact is EU is a major importer of soybean, co corn and canola products and mainly used for livestock and poultry uh, purposes. 34 million tons of GM grain, uh, grain is imported and almost all this grains are, uh, is coming from South and North America, where GM technology adoption is over 90%, even we will look at that in a while in the report. We have reports, although this is not a very recent newspaper cutting, but then we have um, reports where Europeans position is uh, becomes a, a trade barrier for African countries, where Europe uh, puts uh, unwritten guidelines saying that uh, whatever is imported from uh, Africa must come from uh, farms that do not grow GM crops or countries that are not doing anything to do with GM crops. So this creates a trade barrier for Africa and Africa is ready to take on this technology. And we will also hear about this in the report. More on Europe uh, EU factor, we hear, uh, we see this that Action 8, um, an organization based in Uganda, they have criticized the counterparts, Ugandan counterparts for saying GM crops causes cancer. And then we have seen that the same organization then apologizes because EU puts some pressure on the organization to retract their statement. And on July 12, 2017, we also saw France and Netherlands they have um, approved Oxitex GM mosquitoes to be saved, uh, to be safe for release, but this is for release in their more tropical islands. So we see that when everyone else is working so hard for livelihood, now EU position is more for lifestyle where they want to safeguard their tourism in this tropical island. So this is where we really urge European stakeholders to think about how their position affect all the other countries. Another um, uh, one last example from EU is this is a report from EU Parliament where EU urges G8 member states not to support GM crops in Africa. And this is under clause number 72. So now let me go to ISA. What is ISA? What does ISA do? ISA is a pioneer in technology transfer. We don't do technology transfer anymore, but we are disseminating and we are transferring knowledge now. Instead of technology, we are transferring knowledge so that uh, there will be increased accessibility, increased adoption and approval for biotech crops and other technologies in agri-biotechnology. So our job, our whatever we have done all this year since 1996, have increased homegrown agri-biotechnology in many countries, especially developing countries, adoption of agri-biotechnology. It has helped to intensify food security and sustainable development. It has uh, helped for uh, policymakers to adopt science-based policies and regulations reduced disruption of trade, raised public understanding and acceptance uh, on modern agri-biotechnology, and also boost uh, women and youth and, uh, participation in science, especially in agri-biotechnology. So very quickly, I'm just going to go through what ISA does. If you go to ISA's website, ISA, I-S-A-A.org, we have got our web, uh, ISA website, which, is, which really has a very strong traffic. We have got uh, more than a half a million users coming from various countries. These are our top countries who come and visit our website. Now that our, our website is actually very, very rich. I will tell you what we have. We have the Crop Biotech Update. It's an e-newsletter that if you become a subscriber, it reaches your out uh, inbox every Wednesday without um, fail. And we have subscribers over 260,000. Um, from Africa, we have got the drumbeat, which has got more than 8 um, million, uh, 8,000 uh, subscribers. And this reaches not only the African region, but also beyond Africa. So I would urge um, stakeholders to subscribe to these two newsletters. Then we have got what is most used, or I would say the most comprehensive biosafety clearinghouse, which is the GM approval database. If you go to this database, which is in our website, you will find all the crops that has uh, that are biotech crops, where is it adopted? And also what are the traits? What are the uh, events? Uh, what are the we have got the global status of GM crops or biotech crops, which um, uh, Professor Paul thing uh, will um, 
launch this uh, uh, later right up to me. So this is uh, what we do every year. We collate the information on biotech crops, what has been adopted for farms. And we are, ISA is the authority. Um, ISA is it's very active on social media. We, are, we have got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we also believe in women empowerment. So we have got um, a platform just for women. We call it Science and She, which also has got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And uh, we want to highlight all stakeholders in women, not only scientists, but also farmers. We've got a blog called Science Speaks. It's all on our website. Please uh, visit that. And as you know, all the other uh, web, um, social media platform as well, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This year, although it was a lockdown pandemic and it was full of limitations, but ISA started with uh, a series of webinar where we, uh, we um, deciphered all the areas in gene editing from uh, all the sectors, from, uh, uh, from uh, crop biotechnology to industrial, microbial, food and medical healthcare, and what are the regulations. So we did that. Uh, and Together with that, we also had another webinar where we spoke about uh, animal biotechnology and all this webinar garnered more than 60,000 participants in total. So this is where ISA is really reaching out to key stakeholders. In Africa, we have got Africa Life Science Knowledge Hub in partnership with UNESCO, where we want to connect with stakeholders. In Malaysia, I uh, founded the Science Media Center Malaysia, equivalent to the SMC in UK. We are very active with physical and online science communication modules and training. And ISA is also very actively involved with CropMOP under the Convention on Biological Diversity meeting. And um, we also organize preparatory meeting both for the Asian region and the African region. These are very important because this is where negotiation is done and it influences all the parties to Katagana Protocol on Biosafety. We have got a whole host of new publications, so you can all look at this in the website as well. I'm not going to go into details, but these are downloaded very heavily by the key stakeholders in agri-biotechnology. We also started the short course on agri-biotechnology, biosafety and communication, or we call it ASCA. Uh, and this year was the third year. And this is very important where we create a platform in Asia, very close to the home, so they do not have to travel to many... Uh, countries like Europe and uh, US. So uh, this is where policymakers, regulators, media, industry players, scientists come and we do the capacity building on agri-biotechnology regulations and communication. For the first time, the office, uh, the regional center in Africa did the African short course on biosciences. And this both will be, a, this, uh, will be an annual uh, short course. So now, as I said, this is what we do in ISA for the past almost three decades. What's next for ISA? I would like to put the uh, spotlight onto ISA 2.0. And this is what we have got next for ISA, where we are going to establish a consortium. It's going to be called Biotrust Consortium. We will launch the logo soon. And our tagline is feeding the world with knowledge on sustainable biosciences. Um, so as a consortium, we are we want partners with uh, uh, who are like-minded, with uh, who share the same uh, objectives, common objectives, to join us so that we can uh, we can exchange information, we can work as a network, and we can leverage on each other's strength. Our purpose uh, statement for the Biotrust Consortium is to eliminate hunger and malnutrition in a thoughtful and sustainable manner. And our mission statement is sorry. Our mission statement is to uh, promoting transparency and knowledge sharing on agricultural biosciences, where we instill trust in food system, allowing safe and effective innovations to contribute to a sustainable future. I would say the key word here is transparency and trust. And this is where probably we lost the previous battle on genetic modi uh, modification or GM. And we see this happen in Europe, where the trust from the consumers did not go to the government, but it lies on the NGOs or the environmentalists, the critics of biotechnology. So we think that trans, trust and transparency is very, very important. Our vision is a world where agricultural biosciences contribute to sustainability, societal well being, and prosperity. So ISA has been working on crop biotechnology, and we have been uh, so much farmer centric. Today, uh, we are looking at beyond crop biotechnology. We are looking at new breeding technologies in all areas, gene editing, synthetic biology, gene drive. 
we're looking at biomass because biomass can be converted to just any complex organic compound for any industry. It is just a matter of getting the right bacteria and tweaking it so that it does the job. We are also going to look at livestock, poultry, aquaculture. This is the protein century. So we need to support this industry in a sustainable manner. We're going to look at my, uh, microbial technologies. As I said, we can just develop any uh, uh, compound using precision uh, fermentation. Uh, and future food. Future food is where lab made food, cultured me uh, meat in the lab. And we strongly think this is going to be the future because this is going to save the planet. So precision fermentation is going to be the next uh, wave in agribiotechnology and ISA is going to work on all these in, um, areas to make sure that knowledge is transferred and all these areas are also communicated with um, two pillars, transparency and trust, as I mentioned earlier. So as I said, we are going to go beyond farmers and we're going to build trust and transparency among all stakeholders, consumers, is going to be a focal point and also scientists, industry, traders, manufacturers, youth and women and social licensing. We have seen how agri-biotechnology products has to get approval from regulatory agency, but we realize that the newer product will need the um, approval from the uh, society. So this is where we are going to engage the society more and uh, um, ensure that social licensing happens. So with that, we are very excited about ISA 2.0 or the Biotrust Consortium. I would end my talk with this quote, let us speak to farmers before speaking for them. And we see uh, many uh, critics are doing this. So please speak to us to become partners to Biotrust Consortium to achieve our common goals. And that is my email address. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all of you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Besla. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mahav uh, for providing this overview and also sharing uh, the future of ISAAA with us. I see that uh, the next annual report will really grow in size uh, if you like to cover all the very interesting and challenging activities uh, you have on your agenda. So uh, it's quite impressive. And I would say from my own uh, personal and professional background, uh, you are really going the right, uh, uh, you're following the right road. And I hope that many of you will join uh, the train that uh, you are going to start. Now, um, this is into the future. Our next speaker, uh, Professor Tang, he will talk about what has uh, been achieved uh, so far. And uh, Professor Tang is uh, managing director uh, of uh, NIE International and an adjunct senior fellow, fellow center for non-traditional security studies, both at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He is also senior fellow, Southeast Asian Region Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, the Philippines. He specializes in food security, agriculture, technology innovations and sustainable bioentrepreneurship. He previously held senior positions in the International Rice Research Institute, the World Fish Center and US universities. He obtained his BSc and PhD from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. He has published over 12 books and 250 papers and visited over 40 countries for work. Among his awards are an honorary DSC from Murdoch University and election as a fellow of several scientific bodies. So quite an impressive uh, agenda you have and also uh, impressive uh, CV. Now we are interested to listen to what you have to report about the global status of biotechnology. Thank you, Professor Tan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wessler. Well, it is indeed a rare privilege to share with you some highlights of the global status of commercialized biotech crops at a webinar that is hosted by our FG Center and myself speaking to you from Singapore to basically a transcontinental audience. Many factors, as we know, continue to drive the importance of biotechnology. 
And Professor Wesley in his introduction mentions some of those. Population growth requiring an increase in food production is the most obvious one that we're all familiar with. And of course, climate change. And then the livelihood of severe food insecurity and undernutrition in low-income countries. And today, the reports from the Food and Agriculture Organization that more than 820 million people still remain hungry. So achieving SDG 2, which is zero hunger by 2030, will indeed require biotechnology applications. But my task today really is to share with you the highlights from 2019. And I'll do it just by quickly sharing with you the adoption uh, in 2019, some important crops and trades, and then some future prospects. And I'll do this in the next 15 minutes or so. 29 countries in 2019 grew 190.4 million hectares of biotech crops. And these were grown by some 17 million farmers globally. Most of them smallholder farmers. And if we look at the global trends, the developing countries have not overtaken the developed countries in terms of area under biotech crops. For 2019, ISA estimates that there were 105.7 million hectares in developing countries compared to 84.7 million hectares in the developed or industrialized countries, roughly 55.5% versus 44.5%. Now, granted that uh, this has been a slight decrease from the previous year, mainly because of uh, decreases in plantings in, in the US, due to a surplus from the previous year with soybeans and also the trade issues that have been plaguing, I think, US exports and also the drought in Australia. But cumulatively, over the, uh, since 1996, we've seen a 112-fold increase in the total biotech area worldwide. So a very significant uh, achievement indeed. And our previous uh, chairman of the board used to say that biotech crops have been the fastest adopted new technology in modern agriculture okay, consistently. Okay. Now, in terms of the regional distribution of, uh, of biotech crops, the Western Hemisphere, i.e. North and South America, uh, have dominated the planted areas. Uh, and then, of course, Asia Pacific is now rising very fast in terms of area grown and then followed by Africa, which my, uh, my colleague Viviana will also share on the excitement that is there. Of course, Europe has always been the laggard, I think, in terms of adoption of growing of biotech crops. We now have 19 what we call mega countries, those growing more than 50,000 hectares. Uh, Vietnam is the latest to be included in this. And I just want to note, again, the, the excitement in Africa where three new countries just in 2019 came on board in terms of growing biotech crops. The uh, top five countries in the world are growing biotech crops together account for some 91% of the biotech crops in 2019. Of these, Brazil and Argentina, and India are the three developing countries that uh, constitute more than the two developed countries, the US and, uh, and Canada, for that matter. Okay. And it's also noteworthy that uh, several countries registered double digit increases in their biotech crop areas. Vietnam, for example, 86%, a very significant increase indeed. The Philippines, 39%, both in maize, two very important food feed crops in those two countries. In Colombia, a 15% increase in both maize and cotton. Now, a few more details are given here. Uh, and, and I want to put in particular to show that beyond the four or five major crops, the big ones, which are cotton, soybean, maize, canola, and alfalfa to some extent, there is a diversity of smaller area crops that are grown uh, in, in, in different regions. Uh, in North America, for example, you know, papaya uh, is, is a recognized crop grown uh, by the United States state. Squash, potato, apples, sugar beets, some of the other crops. 
Later on, I'll share with you some of the other like, more diverse crops with small areas, which really form excitement in many respects. You know, for the increase in the diversity of crops that are now bringing more and more benefits to farmers, especially smallholder farmers, which ISA is very concerned about. Now, in terms of uh, actual crops themselves, soybeans continue to dominate in terms of total biotech area, but the growth in, in global soybean area has started to taper off a bit. Now, this has been matched by increases in maize and cotton. And there's an important side to, to, to the, the statistics shown here. You know, for years, ISA has been predicting that there's a lot of what we call upside in the growth of maize, uh, for not just for feed, but for food as well. Uh, and we're starting to now to see this happen in Africa indeed. And, and the uh, underpinning behind the soybean area, the large areas under biotech soybean, is the big demand for animal feed. Uh, Asia, where, where you know, I am from, Asia annually depends on North and South America for its supply of animal feed to grow the volume, the large volumes of animal protein that our middle class is demanding in Asia. Some 70% of the world's soybeans, in fact, uh, are imported into Asia. And what is interesting in, in 2019 too is that Brazil, for the first time, surpassed the US in terms of biotech soybean area, roughly 15% of 4.7 million hectares. Globally, in fact, Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, have become major players in the soybean industry and helping to feed the rest of the world, including Europe for that matter, with animal feed. Okay. Now, what is also interesting behind the global statistics is the percentage of each of the major crops that is now biotech. Uh, cotton leads the way with some 79% of global cotton, uh, which is now biotech cotton. And suffice to say that in the case of India and China, biotech cotton has been responsible you know, for the growth there in the cotton industry, but also importantly for reviving the livelihoods of very poor smallholder farmers who before could not grow any cotton at all because of pest problems. Soybeans is the second major crop. 74% of the global soybean area is now biotech. Maize, as I indicated earlier, 31%, but has a lot of upside. And we see in the coming years, in fact, you know, significant increases are very likely in both maize and as well as in canola to, to a lesser extent. Okay? So this is the global adoption of the principal biotech crops. From the Asia Pacific, uh, one of the growth areas, 17 countries now either grow or adopt biotech crops. And we distinguish this because nine countries plant, but the eight importing countries are also very important to contribute to the growth in demand for biotech crops. These are countries that, like the EU, many countries in the EU, import biotech crops because they need them to, for animal feed, to, to really grow the demand in, in animal protein. But we're hopeful that with efforts in sharing knowledge and working with regulators and consumers, that some of the importing countries will indeed also become planting countries in the near future. Let me move on to talk about trades. Uh, in the early days, herbicide tolerance was the major trade that was adopted and found very useful indeed by the big farmers in the Western Hemisphere. Today, we see that the Fastest growing trade are the stack trades. In other words, varieties that contain more than one trade. And these usually are the herbicide tolerant and insect resistance traits. And moving on further, uh, to look at the, the regional distribution and by map uh, of the countries and the crops being grown. Uh, and and this, this map, incidentally, is one of the most downloaded assets of ISA. And it's been used so many times in so many seminars and webinars worldwide. There's a lot of good information that underlies uh, each of those tangles that you see. And I won't have time even to go into all this at all. But suffice to say that the 19 biotech mega countries are featured in here. And you can see some of the details 
uh, in those countries. Uh, and, and the hope is that some other countries that are not mega countries yet will develop into so-called mega countries in, in the coming years. Now, some of the excitement. In 2019, we saw a diversification beyond the big four crops or big five crops, if you like, uh, that were grown with biotechnology crops. Uh, the non-browning trade in potatoes and apples in the US, the areas are understandably small. We, we can't expect potatoes, for example, and apples to have the same large areas as the row crops like soybean and then corn. Now, of course, importantly, the eggplant, uh, which is resistant to a particularly devastating insect pest, is now close to 2,000 hectares in Bangladesh. And what is even more promising is that they're active, you know, uh, underway uh, regulatory uh, initiatives for food and feed application in the Philippines for this eggplant. And eggplant is one of the most popular vegetables, but also one that uses amongst the highest number of applications of insecticides, even over 70 applications of insecticides per season. So we can see the value in terms of human health as well. Now, of course, with alfalfa, the low lignin alfalfa in the US and Canada, so I'm 2,000 hectares. Additionally, sugarcane is the other important crop that has come to the surface in 2019. The insect resistant sugarcane in Brazil and Indonesia, the world's largest uh, Muslim country, you know, is now growing drought tolerant sugarcane from 2,000 hectares. And of course, uh, safflower in Australia, high oleic uh, acid safflower. And then in Costa Rica, we have the pink pineapple. This is just to illustrate to you that increasingly we're going beyond the big four or five, the large area biotech crops. And I can even share and attest to the fact that there's a very long and deep pipeline in development by both the public sector and the private sector. So we can anticipate that in the coming years, uh, uh, even a greater diversity will be evident in, in, the, in the variety of biotech crops. Now, beyond just growing, uh, as you mentioned earlier, that ISA also maintains an important database. Uh, and this database allows us to monitor the status of approved events of biotech crops used in food, feed, processing, and cultivation. So the latest statistics show that 71 countries have issued over 4,000 regulatory approvals for some 32 GM crops since 1992. The US has the most number, obviously, and maize as a crop you know, is the one that shows the largest number of approved events, 146 in some 26 countries. And the herbicide tolerant corn uh, is the one that has shown the most popularity. Those are approvals. Now, in uh, 2019, there were also new approvals, which were not reported in terms of cultivation, and which, as Professor Wessler was hinting at, in perhaps of the report for 2020, will also show plantings of these particular approvals themselves. And uh, I won't go through in detail uh, the, the, the actual uh, events and traits. But suffice to say that there will be more variety in terms of traits as well. Okay. We just wanted to highlight uh, some, some important developments in the pipeline, the non-browning romaine lettuce, the resistance to Colorado potato beetle, which potato growers have recognized as one of the most devastating insect pests, the rice, the nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency, soil tolerance, and importantly in Argentina, drought tolerant wheat, which has already been approved uh, and which has not been I mean, planted and which has not been reported because this particular report not only covers 2019. So there'll be further good news in 2020 when we report on 2020 plantings. Just want to very quickly end by sharing the benefits. Uh, and these benefits have been very obvious. Uh, they've been monitored, analyzed by Graham Brooks uh, in the UK. Certainly the increases in crop productivity over the, the decades have been tremendous, equivalent to some US 
$1.5 billion. The fact that increases in productivity uh, have enabled us not to cut down more forests to increase the areas that are needed. Some 231 million hectares have been saved basically from, from land plowing and cultivation. And in terms of pesticide uh, externalities to the environment, the reduction uh, of some 8.6% of insecticide use, amounting to some 776 million kilograms of active ingredients. And the CO2 emissions, which again, the Professor Wessler mentioned in his introduction, the savings uh, in terms of uh, CO2 has been equivalent to some 15.3 million cars being taken off the road. Of course, finally, the, the benefit to small the farmers, the ultimate beneficiary that we're all concerned with. And 17 million farmers have benefited, and if you count in their families, some 65 million people worldwide have benefited uh, from, from the biotech crops. But going forward, though, there's still more work that has to be done to ensure that these benefits continue to get to farmers. If we need uh, more diligence, and of course, forward-looking science-based regulations, which are really key for us to go forward. And for regulators and consumers to critically look at the benefits instead of risk. And of course, maintaining agricultural productivity, the environmental conservation and sustainability is always on the, the, the burner of many of us. And finally, the, the consideration to millions of hungry and impoverished uh, population. So biotech crops indeed can help to address many of the challenges highlighted by the FAO in the, in the seminal report on the future of food and agriculture, published in 2017, talking climate change. And let me just end by saying that biotech continues to be important to meet the 50% increase in food demand by 2050 as projected by FAO. So thank you very much for, for having been part of this webinar, and we look forward to your feedback. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Wesler. Yeah, thank you, Professor Tan. In particular, your slide on the sustainability contributions of uh, biotech crops is uh, quite uh, impressive and should provide a food for thought for all those uh, who work on these new technologies and how we can use them for achieving sustainability uh, objectives and goals. So thanks um, a lot and advice uh, to the audience. Please have a more closer look at the report for 2019. And we really look forward to, to the report for 2020 to see uh, what has happened. Now, um, sustainability issues have been addressed. And uh, we have seen that uh, some regions of the world show more countries adopting the technologies. Other regions are not so prominent. Now we have. Our next speaker, Bibiana Iraki. She is a program director of the AFRI Center of ISA. And she will talk about biotech crop adoption and challenges uh, in Africa. And um, where we have seen there are not so many countries that yet have adopted the technology. But I'm interested to see how the future for Africa looks like. So Bibiana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wesler, for that introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our participants. I'm going to give a brief update on Africa, as you've heard. Uh, but before I begin, allow me to convey uh, some my sincere apologies from our director, Dr. Margaret Karembo, who unfortunately could not join us for this webinar. Uh, so I'm just going to go straight into it and pick up from where Professor Paul Tang left off. He, he left off by you know, speaking about the farmer who needs this technology. So in our line of work, we've had the pleasure of interacting with many farmers who over the years um, have continued to express their frustration about the challenges they face on their farms. And I'm glad uh, that we have one of them with us in this webinar today. And so we'll get to hear directly from the horse's mouth. But this lady and gentleman here illustrate why our farmers urgently need new tools. Um, Christopher Mosia, who you can see there at the top, is a maize farmer in Kenya who we met in 2018. And as you can see, his maize was totally devastated by the form armyworm 
for a new woman up until now, uh, Christopher is still looking for and asking for a sustainable solution to this menace. Um, at the bottom there, you can see Lucia, a cotton farmer who we met in Malawi. Um, we got an opportunity to visit a national performance trial uh, with her and she was very excited. She expressed her excitement when she saw how the, 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 the cotton was performing and uh, was looking forward to the prospects of her being able to adopt uh, or get access to that BT cotton seed so that she's able to, to get the yields that she was witnessing at that national performance trial. And we're glad, as you'll see with the updates that I'll give later, to see that Malawi did take that step and farmers like Lucia have had the opportunity to get access to BT cotton. So the emergence of new pests and diseases and the climate crisis um, calls for an urgent shift in, in our agriculture and how we do farming in this region. Uh, we cannot continue to subject our farmers to only using traditional tools, especially if we intend to feed an ever-growing population. Further, according to data at the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya, the average farming population in this country is approximately 65 years of age and that that's old. Um, meaning that the younger generation have shunned agriculture for what they consider to be, you know, more sophisticated white collar jobs. Um, and who would blame them? I mean, I, I sit in that youth bracket and I would definitely not want to do uh, farming with this kind of tool. Um, the crude tools that our, our forefathers have used in the past. And so we need uh, to, to figure out how to move away from this, what we call agenda in this part of the world um, and, and make farming a bit more attractive. Um, you know, it needs to be efficient, it needs to be smart and we need to have pleasurable tools. And I think this is what is going to attract the youth back um, into farming. Um, so this is primarily what motivates us at, at ISA. We are inspired by farmers like this lady you see on this tractor here, Maria Swelle, who had, we also got a chance to meet in South Africa. Um, her livelihood has tremendously improved from her BT Cotton Enterprise. And we look forward to a time when African farmers will have the choice to adopt modern ways of farming and have an opportunity to put down those crude tools that I, I, I said were called gembes in this part of the world. We look forward to a time when they will have a choice to be able to put those gembes down if they like. And, and farmers are smart, are a smart lot. So they will make the choice that works best for them. I think, but the important thing and the thing to stress here is that the farmers need the right to choose. Um, that brings me to today's update. Where is Africa in as far as biotech crops are concerned? So this is a status, I'm going to be talking about the status of commercialized biotech crops in Africa by 2019. And, and for star starters, we grew about 3 million hectares of biotech crops. And the number of countries with commercial approval increased from three um, to six. So we have farmers in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Malawi, in Eswatini, in South Africa and in Nigeria commercially growing biotech crops. Kenya, as you can see here, is in light green. Um, and that's because they give the commercial approval, the, the Kenyan cabinet gave a commercial approval in December of 2019 to plant um, BT cotton. And I think that that had started in 2020 um, with the farmer demonstration trial. And I think we'll get to hear a bit more about that from, from one of the farmers that is a beneficiary to this. Um, there's also a lot of research that is currently ongoing in, across the region. And just to highlight, for instance, in Uganda, Mozambique, Burkina Faso, um, and Ghana, there they are a number of crops that are undergoing confined, confined field trials. And what's important to note here is that that research is being led by African scientists working on crops and traits, about 16 traits of interest to Africa's unique challenges. So they're looking at things such as drought tolerance, virus resistance, nutritional enhancement, to name a few. And we're looking at the approved 
crops in Africa. Uh, we, uh, there was about four crops that were approved for cultivation in 2019, and that is maize, soybean, cotton, and very recently a new kid on the block, cowpea. Um, Nigeria became the first country globally to approve cultiva cultivation of BT cowpea after the very able National Biosafety Management Agency gave the green light in 2018. Um, and all this is thanks to the work of Professor Ishak, who you see at the top uh, right over here, that, you know, through his efforts and together with working um, with a lot of partners, was able to deliver this seed that farmers had been demanding for and it was finally able to get into farmers' hands. We also have six pipeline uh, research uh, crops in R&D, research and development. And this is a banana, cassava, potato, rice, sorghum, and plantain, all being led by African scientists. And cassava over here again is in green because we saw Kenyan scientists submitting an application to the National Biosafety Authority uh, for environmental release. And we are hoping um, at some point next year that uh, that approval is going to be uh, given and, and that eventually farmers are going to to be able to access uh, cassava that is resistant to brown strict disease, which totally devastates cassava production in this part of the world. So as far as the adoption trends are concerned, we can see that Africa is still somewhat lagging behind the rest of the world with only about 1.54% adoption compared to you know, the North and South America that take up uh, together take up about 88% of the global adoption share. And there are several reasons for this, and I think a number of them have already been discussed by Maha, and we'll probably discuss more of this as we continue with the discussion. Uh, we've seen a lot of aggressive active activism. Uh, we've seen some policy bottlenecks, and these are it's because of misinformation and disinformation. And we've also seen over-regulation that is delaying access of a number of products in the market. And I think that speaks to, you know, why Africa, I mean, this is a whole continent of about 54 countries only has that share, uh, percentage share in as far as adoption is concerned. Now, um, South Africa is still the leading country in terms of adoption in Africa, uh, with about 2.7 million hectares under biotech crops in 2019. And as you can see from the graph, uh, it's been an upward trend since about 90, uh, since about 98 when they first adopted uh, biotech crops. But around 2014 and 2015, we saw a slight but that was warranted by various issues such as drought and delays in planting. And more importantly, uh, we have seen an uh, acreage is kind of plateauing uh, with the three main crops being maize, cotton, and soybean. Um, and biotech maize increased by approximately 2.8%. And then um, when we go to Sudan, which is the second uh, country with the highest acreage in Africa, they grew BT cotton on about 236,000 hectares. Um, and they, at this point, are at about 95% adoption. Again, there was a slight decline due to seasonal fluctuation um, of the weather. And at some point, there was you know long period between the flooding uh, that was followed by a long dry spell, which subsequently interfered uh, with the planting. And that's why we got to see the slight decline um, in acreage in Sudan. But more importantly, we have been able to see livelihoods in Sudan incre uh, improve tremendously as a, re as a result of adoption of BT cotton. And farmers have been giving amazing testimonies of how you know, their lives are changing or have transformed because of, of BT cotton. Now, in terms of um, farm income gains, uh, cumulatively between 1996 and 2018, there has been uh, an opportunity cost for Africa there, uh, with only uh, the continent only gained about 1.1% uh, of that farm income gain within that between the period of 96 to 2018, compared to the rest of the world. Um, again, the largest share was seen in South Africa, which is Africa's largest and first adopter of biotech crops. Uh, where the average yield increase for BT maize was about 11.1% and for BT cotton was about 24% over that uh, period. 
uh, when it comes to the regulatory and policy landscape, uh, there was some progress that was witnessed in Niger, uh, in Niger in 2019, the country approved a biosafety law, and we are hoping that that will open it up uh, to some 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 work on biotech and uh, hopefully adoption in the in the near future. Um, however, we continue to see some challenges, as can be seen on the graph, where some countries have been stuck within this yellow area. This is where we you know they're just doing a lot of research, confined field trials, stuck at the confined field confined field trials stage. Um, and in an ideal world, we would want to see, you know, a straight line where they move from confined field trials to the national performance trials, and then to full commercialization. But instead, we have witnessed a number of twists and turns. You take one step back, you take two, be, uh, two behind. Um, so there's, there's been a number of twists and turns um, due to various external factors such as the regular or the over-regulation burden that I mentioned earlier that's taking very long to get products into the market. It's costly. Um, there's been some political interferences, for instance, in Kenya, where we were doing great uh, in as far as almost delivering uh, BT cotton. I mean, the research, I think, for this started in the year 2000 and, you know, almost uh, two decades later is when we we're able to get this product into the market. Uh, but political interference, the Seralini study coming in and, and suddenly, you know, we have a ban in the country and that has slowed down research and adoption of the technology. And then again, the EU factor that was very well articulated by Maha earlier on, um, and we're going to discuss this a bit more, I think, later on, the fear of losing the EU market and, you know, some of that advertising of GMO free and the pronouncements around EU being GMO free has not served um, the region very well in as far as you know, the policies and the regulations around this technology. So what we have learned uh, from COVID-19 and the pandemic um, is, is that uh, there's and the three, this, these are the three things that have stood out for us. There's unprecedented disruption in the food system, and that has made a bad situation worse in as far as food security um, is concerned. Um, and we therefore need to facilitate the transition of biotech crops in the R&D pipeline to commercialization to address uh, what we are, of course, going to see as an imp impeding food shortage moving uh, ahead. And then there's need to there's the, the need to trust um, and invest in science has been thrashed to the fore. And I think this is an opportunity for us to reinforce the message on the need to apply science-based and efficient regulations on GM crops. And lastly, we also need to tap into the pot potential of new breeding techniques such as genome editing for agriculture, health and uh, environment and the industry and the, the three key things that we need to address in as far as this is concerned. Um, the strong held misconceptions, those are overdue and those need to be addressed. Uh, there's very little know-how on plant breeding, so there needs to be a lot more effort in making sure that the public has a better understanding on plant breeding. Um, and the biotech private sector, we've seen when that is, is, is not there and when it's, it's not as thriving, um, then, you know, it creates, it, it creates this misperception um, that this is a technology from the West uh, that is being pushed down our throats. And so we need to, to, to make sure that that is, you know, that that, that is working moving forward. Um, we are also, you know, looking ahead, have a cautious uh, prediction. Um, we, we expect uh, to see some crops, uh, you know, at least three new crops in the global basket. I mentioned cassava earlier, and we're expecting to see a banana and potato. So we see Africa contributing a number of crops, and we see more countries coming in uh, and adopting the technology. And uh, to finalize, we keep asking ourselves, what is it that we need to do to ensure that we position ourselves as a leader and not as a follower? And three key things stand out for us. We've got to have political goodwill in the region, and the African Union needs to take up this role and really lead um, this, uh, the, the, this region in as far as that is concerned. We need to harness vi vibrant um, 
African youth. We need to start thinking about getting into bioentrepreneurship and things that are going to excite the youth back into agriculture. And then we also need to look at the new STNI horizons for the fourth industrial re revolution. People are talking about genome editing, synthetic biology. And so we need to tap into that. But for us to be able to do that, we also need to be able to have courage. This is something that Dr. Rufus, the Director General for the National Biosafety Management Agency in Nigeria keeps saying that African regulators must have courage um, and for, uh, for, for us to be able, for them to be able to make uh, the decisions despite um, the overwhelming, in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, despite the threats. So we need a coalition of the willing for us to be able to move forward. And we hope that, you know, under the umbrella of the United African Union, we can be able do that. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Iraqi, uh, for a quite impressive talk. And uh, you said, okay, we need to encourage um, leaders to take decisions. And uh, this now, um, wait. Ah. With this, I like to move directly into our um, panel discussion. Our first uh, panelist will be uh, Daniel Magondu. And Daniel is a small scale farmer from central Kenya and is also chairman of the Society for Biotech Farming of Kenya, which is a registered national farmers association that advocates for incorporation of new biotechnology tools, including GM crops in Kenya's agricultural system. The society has a membership of over 1,000 smallholder farmers and leaders spread across 24 out of the 47 counties in the country, growing both food and cash crops. Daniel is a passionate farmer interested in modern farming technologies. He grows bananas, cotton, and maize, among other food crops. Now, uh, Daniel, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Right, I, I think can yes. hear you. Okay, now, Daniel, I would love to know from you personally why GM crops are so important for your farm, for African uh, agriculture and what you expect from policymakers to help you making use of this uh, technology. Uh, thank you, thank you for giving me this chance. Um, Daniel Magodu, Chairman for Sobisat. Sobisat is Society for the Technology Family of Kenya. This is a adjacent national Association of Biotechnology Farmers. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Go ahead, Can please. Oh, thank you. You can hear me. I'm saying, uh, is the Society for Biotechnology Farming of Kenya, which advocates for incorporation of um, biotech biotechnology crops into Kenya's uh, agricultural system with the name of increasing uh, production and protection farmers yield. Uh, so far, and this is with all scientists, with all the technology stakeholders, including scientists, media, Policy makers, youth, and women, in a concerted effort to achieve a smooth transition of the technology crop, uh, subject. Well, I'm very happy with this afternoon. Uh, Daniel. The one. Daniel, we have difficulties for understanding you. Um, maybe yes. it's a good idea if Hello. you try to log in again and, and, and we move forward with our panel discussion. 
I think uh, maybe you have a possibility to reconnect again that we have a better connection. Okay. Right. Um, sorry for this uh, technological hiccup, uh, but sometimes uh, it is not so easy. Uh, in particular, if we try to organize uh, webinars that involves many people from different sides of the ocean. Um, let me use also this opportunity to welcome the participants that are from the United States and other places that are further away. I know it's in the middle of the night, so I highly appreciate that they are willing uh, to spend their nights uh, joining us uh, today. Now, um, let us continue further in our uh, panel. And um, our next panelist is uh, Max Kadung. He is a PhD uh, student at Wageningen University, and he has a master degree in urban environmental management with a specialization in environmental economics. His research focuses on measuring and monitoring the bioeconomy, and he uses quantitative and qualitative methods to assess the economic, social, and environmental impacts of transitioning from a fossil-based economy to a bio-based um, economy. Now, Max is one of the junior scientists working on uh, the bioeconomy. And Max, the question I have uh, to you is, um, why, do, uh, why is the development in the bioeconomy, why are new developments in plant breeding are so important also for young scientists for their professional uh, career? Uh, yeah, thank you, Justus, uh, for the introduction and uh, also for giving me the opportunity uh, to take part in this uh, discussion. And I think, uh, indeed, uh, the relatively restrictive regulations for uh, biotechnology in the EU uh, does also affect my future career. Um, I did not study biotechnology specifically, and I'm also not researching directly GMOs or gen editing, um, so I'm not even as impacted as uh, maybe young researchers who do that. But uh, still, these um, uh, important technologies for my research, and um, they do affect a lot of researchers in the life sciences in general. Uh, for example, last year, uh, I had the opportunity to go to the uh, CRISPR-Con that took place in, in Wageningen in the Netherlands. And this is an uh, annual conference uh, dedicated to CRISPR-Cas and gene editing. Uh, and they discussed the future of CRISPR. Uh, and they also had many presentations um, that show uh, the work of uh, young scientists uh, on CRISPR applications uh, that looked uh, very promising. So this is where you can find uh, a lot of young researchers, uh, and that's what they are interested in, uh, because um, this offers um, a lot of opportunities uh, to have a direct positive impact on society. Uh, and also, you do not need uh, a vast amount of resources uh, to do research on, on CRISPR-Cas. Uh, yeah, myself, I'm doing research on the bioeconomy, um, which entails uh, producing biomass and also processing biomass further into bio-based products. Uh, specifically, I work on monitoring and measuring uh, this bioeconomy. Uh, and that become clear uh, very quickly that in order to have a successful transition to a bioeconomy, uh, you need to have a lot of biomass available and you also need to be able to process this biomass uh, very efficiently. Uh, so these are both things that uh, bio uh, modern biotechnology can help a lot. Uh, and we can also see that Europe is uh, falling behind a bit in biotech innovations. Uh, for example, the number of CRISPR-related patents uh, in Europe is way lower than in the US or in China. And this uh, gap is even widening uh, in, over the last few years. Uh, so I'm also worried that uh, Europe loses out uh, in this field against the big players in the world. Uh, in a similar way, it has happened uh, with information technologies. And uh, then in the end, we are still forced to use this uh, new technologies anyway, uh, without being involved in the development. Uh, and of course, the driving force behind the bioeconomy is, uh, is to a large degree climate change, uh, which affects especially the future of young people uh, like nothing else before. Uh, so we need to substitute uh, a lot of products that so far are based on fossil resources, uh, for example, chemicals as well. Uh, and in order to scale up the production of bio-based chemicals, for example, 
uh, biotechnology biotechnology is a very important tool um, then also uh, the bioeconomy is all about efficient production of biomass and processing this biomass uh, in the production of biomass we should uh, reduce for example the use of chemical pesticides um, which can also be done uh, using uh, tools from biotechnology um, and we also need to process biomass into bio-based chemicals uh, to make them a good substitute for uh, fossil resources. Um, and biotechnological innovations are very crucial to drive this development in the future. Um, but we also already know that we cannot stop climate change completely. So we need to already thinking about how to increase our uh, uh, capacity to adapt rapidly to changes that will come. Uh, biotech crops can also deliver a lot of tools to manage uh, adaption to climate change, uh, especially the second generation biotech crops focused a lot on reacting to abiotic uh, stresses uh, such as heat tolerance, uh, drought tolerance and uh, flooding. And for example, there's also a genet genetic modification of plants uh, uh, possible to fix more carbon. And uh, the final point I would like to make is that we should not look only at the risk of using new technologies such as gene editing. Uh, but we also have to look at the risk of continuing the way uh, we are doing now, um, which is, especially with regard to climate change, very high. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves if we can afford not to use all the tools uh, that we have to address this uh, big challenge. All right, Max, uh, thanks a lot for a very comprehensive overview about uh, what young scientists think about um, with respect to the contribution of new developments in biotechnology uh, and to address uh, future uh, issues that are quite challenging. And now I, I like to ask uh, uh, Professor Tan, if you look at what uh, uh, Max Gardung has mentioned, right? Um, based on your long-term experience working on uh, uh, GM crops, to what extent these new uh, developments can really materialize? If you look at the data on, on GM crops, some say that is quite impressive. Others are also more critical say, well, it's only, if you look at the number four to five mayor crops dominating, you have mentioned a few other crops that are now entering the market, but basically it's a disappointing, much more should have been applied, much more should have been achieved. Many more countries should have introduced the technologies. So how do you look at it? What are we able to pick up these technologies? Are we able to convince other countries to make use of these technologies? Sure. Uh, well, that, that's actually a, a very profound question <laughs> that has many different angles to try and answer. You know, but, but the point is that if we do look at the progress that's been made, you know, the, the record stands for itself. There's a lot to be proud of. Even with the four or five major crops that have been adopted, you know, the 190.4 million hectares and so on, you know, 29 countries, and with still a lot of potential upside, okay, just for the biotech GM crops alone. It is still a lot of upside. And as we said in Africa, for example, you know, and even in Asia for that matter, it's still a lot of upside yeah, to occur. Now, you mentioned the new technologies. Uh, I suppose you're in particularly referring to gene editing. Okay, I, I think that, you know, if we look at the history, there have been several roadblocks. The regulatory roadblocks have been one of them. Now, ISA helped to slowly overcome those roadblocks by helping national systems develop their regulatory frameworks and systems, and also participating in international fora that you know help to harmonize regulations and so on. So regulations are actually very key. In fact, the regulatory hurdle to accepting new technology is by no means limited to biotechnology alone, to any, any other new technology. But in the case of gene editing, I think the positive things are this. You know, if you take the Australian regulations, for example, they, they, uh, they kind of initiated to, to classify gene editing, you know, products in the different categories by virtue of the process, right? The SDN1, 2, and 3. Now, SDN1 and 2 are mainly not regulated at all. You know, basically, they, they don't contain transgenes. Okay? So they're not subject to the same kind of detailed, rigorous, and, and, and required regulatory processes. Okay? They have put off, in fact, many countries from, from adopting biotech. 
I think the other part too is something that my colleague uh, Maha mentioned. This is social licensing and public acceptance. I think we've got a real opportunity, you know, given the, the uh, seriousness of some of the challenges facing us, which Max partly touched on. You know, the, the, the climate change is just one of them, really. The nutrition issues, all of which all these potential new technologies can produce, you know, products that can really help us. Yeah, and I think as Max so rightly put it, you know, what is the cost of not adopting the technology? I think we've got to get more and more consumers on our side to much better awareness building programs. And we're starting to see that happen now with all these new technologies. Yeah. And the fact that some countries have already deregulated gene editing is a good sign. Uh, Japan, for example, in Australia, have come up with really rational, you know, kind of guidelines for adoption of gene editing. Even the small country like Singapore, you know, we're, we're moving very strongly, in fact, in the gene editing for all kinds of, not just agriculture, but also food applications, yeah? So I see, in fact, a lot of promise for the future, but learning from the mistakes we made, you know, with, with the, the early tranche of biotech products, especially GMOs, I think we've learned now to be much better prepared, okay? To, to, to recognize the fact that benefits alone are not enough to convince people. Uh, and this is where the trust thing comes in. Yeah. So, so that's my long answer to your short, short question, I'm afraid. Yes, <laughs> I you. think there's no short answer to uh, uh, this question. You're absolutely right. And um, I'm full on your side saying uh, it's, uh, it's not only uh, um, talking about benefits and, and, and costs, we have to establish uh, trust and uh, uh, um, and uh, showing the opportunities that uh, these mm -hmm. technologies offer. Now we will try to reconnect again uh, to Daniel. So Daniel, can you hear us? Daniel? Hear you. I can hear you. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? The connection is still very bad. So uh, you can hear me now. Yeah, yeah now that's it's better. better. I'm now better. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can hear me. <laughs> okay, yeah. I can't move. <laughs> I'm not going to move. Well, I was saying that um, yes, our society. Society for Biotechnology Farming of Kenya engages with all stakeholders, including scientists, uh, policymakers, media, youth and women in a certain effort to achieve a smooth transition of biotechnology crop from research to product. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very grateful and very humbled to be one of the panelists representing the farmers in this global dialogue. Uh, it, it would be very unfortunate for the farmers whose lives are most impacted by the advances of the technology being left out during the biotechnology dialogue. Mine, I'm going to food to touch about the challenges which is making Africa, Africa, uh, GM crops to be very important in Africa. Well, as I started, I'm a smallholder farmer. I do grow cotton and maize and other food crops. But to my surprise, after growing all these foods during the harvest, I share with the pests, diseases, mm -hmm. and the drought. And mm -hmm. to clarify this, I grow cotton for food security. When the maize uh, dries up because of harsh weather, I'm left with the cotton. But mm -hmm. the same cotton is bundled invested by cotton borewarm. And if I fail to apply pest controls for over 12 times, I either get nothing or very poor harvest. Mm -hmm. If you come to maize, maize, I grow it because it is our staple food crop. You find that 
it is badly attacked when the season is good. It is badly attacked by uh, mis stem bowlers, mis leathern crosses, and the droughts. So I'm urging the scientists to concentrate more on food crops like maize, cassava, which is badly affected by cassava brown street virus that you cannot even take it to market nor can you feed the animals. It goes to waste after harvesting. To concentrate on maize, um, rice, cassava, bananas, wheat, potatoes, among many others. Because as a farmer, I would like to plant and harvest more to feed my family and the surplus for economic benefits. The other thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that we know we have pandemic like COVID-19. Pandemic has a vaccine, but we don't have vaccine for poverty, hunger, and climate change. We need, we need agricultural biotechnology in Africa because it will address most of the challenges the farmers of this country are facing. And if we are going to adapt this technology, the cases of sphere farming in our countries, the cases of importation of grains from other countries, and the cases of poverty will be a past tense. And as I conclude, register, ladies and gentlemen, uh, year 2019 will remain a history in my in my in my life when the president of this republic, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, and his cabinet uh, approved the commercialization of BT cotton in our country to support the manufacturing pillar. And I'm sure this one will change the day-to-day -day life of so many farming communities in the Republic of Kenya and all the textile industries will start operating at a full swing and our youth will start getting jobs from these industries. Uh, Thank you for giving me that chance. I'll stop there, hoping that everything is going to be all right with you because we need the technology very much in Africa. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Daniel Mogundo, uh, for sharing your views uh, uh, from Africa. And uh, I think most of us that are uh, listening uh, support uh, your uh, um, claim and uh, request uh, for uh, better access to technologies uh, that uh, address the needs that you are facing. And in particular, and I'm happy that you have mentioned this in times of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, which adds onto the challenges uh, that people are facing all over the world. And uh, you have rightly pointed out that um, technology will be very um, uh, important. And uh, Professor Teng has also uh, mentioned in his uh, short contribution that uh, the uh, uh, regulatory environment plays a very important uh, role. He has been very positive about the developments in many parts of the world. In some areas, like in the European Union, um, people are a little bit more pessimistic about uh, the support from the policy side, uh, the uh, regulatory uh, challenges uh, that the private sector is facing. Now, I would love to ask Bibiani Iraqi um, to what extent what the European Union is doing on the policy side may be important for Africa. 
you have mentioned also a number of policy challenges there. Does Europe play a role how African policy leaders think about these new technologies? Thank you so much, Professor Westline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel Magondu, for you know that very elaborate um, brief that you've given us. And I, I like that you ended by saying that we need the technology um, very much in Africa. But unfortunately, we have seen that, yes, the, the decision and the policies uh, from the EU do a lot of times affect how things happen in this part of the world. Uh, we know that historically um, Africa has a very unique ties uh, with Europe um, and the, the two countries do have a lot of especially very strong trade ties. I think this is the primary reason why European policies are important in Africa because we've seen that African policy makers are so afraid of losing this European market, um, so much so that the policies they end up developing in this part of the world are more often than not new market um, as opposed to focusing on our needs as a region, as I'm looking at some of the things that Daniel Magondu very uh, clearly outlined about, you know, the pest and disease challenge and the, uh, and the drought challenge that, that we're currently facing. So our policymakers are driven more by this fear of losing um, the, the European market and the misinformation and the misconceptions and the aggressive activism that we have seen coming in from you know, Europe into Africa, uh, you know, that's painting this picture that the EU is anti-GMO or is GMO free um, has led to a lot of reluctance from various countries from adopting this technology which is really unfortunate given our challenges. As my, Maha I highlighted earlier, we're talking about a lifestyle versus livelihood uh, situation here. So um, yes, uh, unfortunately, the policies that you develop that do have an impact, uh, but we're starting to see a shift. And I think this is because of a lot of the work that we've been doing in as far as engaging our policy makers and helping them to see. And I cannot tell you how important this brief that ISA launches on an annual basis makes a difference in, in, in Africa, because then they get to see what the global trends are, what the world is doing, and, and then they're able to make evidence-based decisions um, in as far as the policy making is concerned, but we're also glad to see that even with the new breeding techniques that are coming up, Africa is taking a very different um, position on this. We, we know the decisions that have come from the EU with regards to you know, genome editing, uh, the recent pronouncements that were made, but in Africa, the three leading countries, Nigeria, um, Kenya, and, and South Africa that have begun developing guidelines on genome editing have taken you know, very um, progressive stance on, on this technology. And, and, and you know, that is something that excites us um, as, as a region. And, and you know, we're, we're looking forward to seeing, and we're really hoping that this technology will not face the same fate that GMOs have in the past. Okay, thank you for, for, for sharing this. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, members of the European Union uh, could not participate on this panel. We invited them and um, they are a little bit reluctant and I'm, uh, I, I can share this here. Um, as the European Commission is preparing um, uh, a response a strategy how to address uh, the uh, judgment of the European Court of Justice and how to uh, further develop, uh, improve, change uh, the current policies at European level. And the report will be published in April 2020. And after that, they are happy to get engaged into a discussion. So I guess that we will be able to have them on a panel for the 2020 report uh, prepared by ISA, at least that is what they have promised uh, to us. Um, now, uh, I could see that we have a lot of uh, question and answers and activities within the chat. Now, uh, may I ask Catalina Mesa, she's a student at Wageningen University and monitoring the chat. Um, what are the major issues that have been discussed there and are there specific questions that uh, have been addressed to the panel? Yes. Can you hear me well? 
Perfect. So I would like to start with one of the initial questions to to Maya, to Maha, uh, regarding the what can be done if scientists, uh, government, with all the policymakers, and the community, uh, especially people, uh, local communities and farmers, uh, fail to agree on policies and laws governing and regulating biotechnology uh, and GMO research in a country. Uh, how to overcome these differences. Okay, Selena, for that uh, question. Now, what I would say is we really need an outreach program, and this is exactly what ISA is doing. So we have to engage various stakeholders. And um, I mean, this is a broad range of stakeholders from scientists, policymakers, regulators, uh, media. We, we do a lot of engagement with media and even the public. So this is where we need to create the the, um, the pressure from the consumers, from the beneficiaries, so that the government will feel that this is what the people need. Like just the farmer from Kenya said that they really want the technology. They want to have access to the seed. So we need to create the awareness on the uh, benefits. And also we need to be transparent, as I mentioned in my slides. We need to be transparent about the risk, how risk assessment and management is being done. And this is all what we do. And I would say COVID-19 is um, providing, is opening opening many doors for us to talk about the technology. And um, we all know the vaccine is going to be an mRNA vaccine. So how can we leverage this situation so that we say the same technology is needed to ensure food security, malnutrition, sustainable farming? So I would urge scientists not to be a bystander anymore and be actively involved in outreach programs. Perfect. Uh, there is a question uh, regarding the European Union that agreed uh, to set a more ambitious target for reducing the greenhouse uh, gases emissions by year uh, 2030. And the, re the reduction is by 55%. Uh, is there any possibility that biotech crops will be grown in the European Union? Maybe if someone can answer this one. Yeah, let me... Um... <laughs> On uh, to being uh, the one here from Europe, basically on on the um, uh, panel, um, this is very difficult uh, to answer a uh, question. And uh, as I mentioned uh, before, the European Commission is preparing a dossier on how to uh, respond to the judgment by the European Court of Justice on new plant breeding uh, technologies. How this assessment will look like is can be either in the one direction or going into the other direction. Uh, there are um, at EU level people who are in strong support of new developments in uh, modern biotechnology and, and um, arguing for providing access to these technologies, while there are also others who are more critical toward these uh, technologies do not necessarily see them as being needed for addressing climate change and other issues that technologies that are already available will be able to address uh, these kind of uh, challenges i myself i'm very skeptical about this view i think we need these new technologies to be able to respond to what max Kardung has uh, uh, mentioned within the European Union, but also for the rest of the world, looking at Africa, looking at Southeast Asia, et cetera. With what we have now on the table, it seems to be difficult to do this without em embodying uh, new technologies. But also what is needed is to have a policy strategy behind this that goes beyond the European Union, that includes the rest of the world as well. And what Mai was saying, right? getting all these different stakeholders on board, trying to identify a strategy where the world is working together, I think that will be one of the big challenges. And from that perspective, and then I'm more optimistic, I think the EU will not exclude itself from uh, making a contribution there. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. I have a, a couple of questions for Dr. Uh, Paul Fein uh, regarding his presentation and, and what is the reason behind the sharp decrease in the area under GM crops in the industrialized countries that you presented it was a decrease? I'll try and answer the question. I don't think there was a sharp decline at all. 
uh, there was a slight decline, and that was actually overtaken by the sharp increase in the developing countries. Okay, so, so I, I don't think it was a sharp decline. It was a slight decline, and the developed countries tend to respond to market forces. Okay, so last year we saw a big decline in the soybean area in, in North America, mainly because the year before was surplus production, so there were leftover stocks. That was one of the reasons. And the second, I think, as we're all aware, the U.S. Uh, how shall we put it diplomatically has uh, created a lot of trade issues. I think it's the best way to put it. Okay? So that their export market, you know, is not as lucrative as it used to be. Okay? And of course, the, the fortunate part, the reverse side of that is that Latin America has made up for the difference. So Latin American farmers are smiling, and they're growing more soybeans and maize as well. And maybe my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Aldemita, may want to chip in on this. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, actually, I was uh, trying to respond to that by, uh, by, by typing, and then I said this would be a good question to discuss during the open forum. And I, I, agree, I agree with you, sir. And there were surplus and the trade issues, which uh, really dominated the reason why. And also, we know that Australia and Canada, which are both industrialized countries, were affected by extreme uh, conditions mm -hmm. during the growing season. That's why there was a decline. This is specifically true in Australia, where they had the, the, the worst drought in history, that mm -hmm. they planted the lowest area uh, to cotton. So they were very much affected by very bad uh, planting conditions. Thank you. Perfect. And um, regarding the presentation of Viviana Iraqi, uh, there is a question about the, what are the prospects. Uh, there isn't a specific question in Kenya, but maybe we can develop in general in, in Africa. The prospects for accelerating approvals by regulatory authorities for new useful improvements. And there is an example that, uh, for instance, the late blight resistant tree are Victoria potato developed by Mark Gishlein. All right, fantastic. Thank you for that question. And I, I think Mark and his team have done a fantastic job um, towards that end. Uh, when you talk about the prospects of accelerating approval, um, I'm not sure there's any way that we can accelerate approval because there are guidelines and timelines as prescribed by the law that we need. I think the question is even specific to how can that be done in Kenya. Uh, Mark and his team, of course, would need to sub, uh, apply to the National Biosafety Authority to have uh, the late blight potato, um, you know, up, up, uh, approved in the market. So they'd have to do an environmental release application for that and submit a dossier. Um, and when they do that, the time between the application and um, at the, um, the time between the application and before a decision is made takes between 90 to I think 150 days. Um, but the only way for them to at least increase the chances of that being a positive outcome is they've got to start engaging. And I think they've already done this and ISA has provided a platform through the Open Forum on Agricultural Biotechnology where we get scientists like Mark Gislin and his team to come and engage with the regulators, with the policymakers, so that they can get the public to begin to understand the work that they're doing. Um, and when it comes to that point where they do the environmental release application and in our law, we have the provision for public participation. Then the public is engaging and giving comments on this application from a point of understanding because the researchers have already done their work in as far as engaging um, the public and the, different, the people who will even be making a decision on that application. And like I mentioned, we have provided an, a platform um, at, at ISA through the Open Forum on Agricultural Biotechnology for that kind of engagement to take place. So they could continue or start from places such as OFA, which are in different African countries if we're looking at the regional context. Perfect, thank you. I'm not sure if we still have more time for another question or one more okay there is uh, one more related with uh, europe again and and if what is the role of large agrochemical companies or the patenting system in the lack of gmo adoption 
Oh, let, let me say a, a, a few words um, on, on this. Um, now, we know from economic theory that uh, if you have regulations, they, they are what we consider sunk costs. And that basically makes it more difficult for smaller companies to enter the market in relation to larger companies. So it's not surprising that some of the larger companies are not necessarily against stronger regulation because it keeps competitors out of the market. So it's protecting their own market. And that is um, particularly uh, true uh, for the uh, European uh, Union. Now, what this implies with respect to the new um, plant breeding technologies, if they will not be allowed, or let me phrase it differently, if they will be under the GMO regulation, then using these new technologies will become very expensive. And again, this will be to the disadvantage of smaller uh, plant breeding companies. So be to the disadvantage of uh, small scale uh, companies and will support uh, larger uh, companies. And that is one of the outcomes, the negative outcomes one may observe. And some of the critics um, are not necessarily in strong support of larger uh, global companies, but they, mm. with their line of, of reasoning, basically just support such kind um, of uh, developments. Uh, but maybe Max Kardung has also a view on this. He has been involved on, on some of these studies looking into uh, the uh, uh, structure of uh, the bioeconomy. What is your view, Max? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, definitely like um, the regulatory hurdles in, in Europe are, and the European Union are quite high. And this is definitely like... Uh, uh, already stopping these new developments in biotechnology at the beginning. Like there's uh, there's uh, larger hurdles to even get into the market. And also for bigger companies, uh, the hurdle to uh, to develop new technologies to, to start innovation uh, is higher than in other regions. And I think that's why um, uh, in, in Europe there's uh, less of uh, a lower development. Uh, this part. Um, may I also use this opportunity to ask uh, Daniel Magondu, I think you can still hear us. Are you exploited by large scale technology providers in your country? Daniel, could you hear us? Well, thank you. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, well, we are not having such big uh, large scale farmers in, in our country, but um, with the time I know <clears throat> uh, we might, we might be, but so far I'm not very sure about that. And how is, um, how do you get your seeds? Are um, you are prevented from using your seeds on your farm? For example, saving seeds, that is something that, uh, many uh, environmental and other groups are concerned about? No, we are not prevented from using our seeds, but those ones who are bringing their seeds, uh, they bring them to the shops. And once you plant a certified seed, you realize it has got some returns, better returns than the conventional seeds. So if, we can come up with this technology and we get seeds that can <clears throat> have insect resistance with drought traits and disease free, we are going to enjoy the benefits of the modern agricultural biotechnology tool. Okay, if I understand this correctly, what Daniel has said so far, he doesn't seem to be this as being a concern that there will be exploitation by, for example, the technology uh, provider, and he would be happy to use uh, uh, seeds that uh, 
also address issues posed by uh, climate change. I think um, we have reached now uh, the end uh, of our webinar. I like to thank all of the presenters and uh, participants in the panel uh, for uh, their contributions. I highly appreciate the depth uh, that we have seen today. I also like to thank all the uh, participants in the chat and that are watching us from uh, almost all over the world for staying awake and uh, contributing via the chat and Q&A facilities of uh, Zoom to the uh, discussion and debate. This session has been uh, recorded and will be made available so you soon can watch it also at the ISAAA uh, website. Um, you see here my background picture. Uh, that is from the lovely place of Ravello in Italy. And next year, the International Consortium on Applied Bioeconomy Research will host its 25th anniversary by the end of June in Ravello. And I hope uh, that many of you will be able uh, to attend uh, the conference. But before we finish, I'd like to hand over to Roda Romero Aldemita, or Ola for short, uh, for some uh, closing statements. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Wessler. Actually, this is uh, our first, just like what Maha said, this is our first engagement in Europe and we were very excited to hold it with you because we know that uh, what's happening in Europe has always been uh, being asked. Every time we go out, every time we have engagements, why is Europe like this and that? And so there have been some uh, responses that we heard. So we know the situation, we know the regulation and the scientists are very enthusiastic in developing and producing products that can be used not only in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, there have been problems in terms of um, some uh, ideology somehow or non-scientific things, but we hope that it's gonna be um, uh, gone by when we have the new breeding innovations. And uh, we're really hopeful that uh, the European Union would once again bounce back and uh, look at science as one of the uh, uh, instruments so that we can help our country be more, your country or the European Union to be more sufficient and to, to compete in um, the rest of the world. And we know that uh, the example of Africa, we have seen how Africa is doing their scientists, uh, training their scientists and helping farmers to reap the benefits of biotechnology. That's why we highlighted Africa at this uh, forum. And uh, we're happy that, uh, well, we're, we're not, uh, uh, we were waiting for Dr. Klaus Amann to join us, but unfortunately he's not able to do so, but we hope we can confer with him again next time when we have the engagement. And we're looking forward that this is the first, ISA's first engagement in Europe and we will have <clears throat> succeeding ones in the very near future and we're hoping that it will come very soon. So with that, thank you very much again for your participation and uh, we hope to see you. Our next webinar will be on Friday. It's going to be in, with Argentina and the Latin American countries. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>